Are you kidding me? Classical music's at one of its best times in its history. No other industry would do this to itself. Our writers spend all the time telling you what's wrong with the industry and not what's right, and there's so much. If you want a case study on how not to brand a business, we're the ones to look to. The tobacco industry does a better job. To be sure, the large institutional paradigm is having problems. Symphonies and operas, those big groups, that structure is, is imploding. But it's a to be expected market correction. And what very few people are writing about is the explosion of chamber music groups. So many of the large groups have painted themselves into a corner by programming the same 19th century classics ad nauseum and your audiences don't want to hear the same music again and again. All across the country, chamber music groups are springing up, led by musicians with really great programming played really well. The classical music world is reflective of the fragmentation of just about every other aspect of 21st century society. Audiences of 2000 are going to happen less and less frequently, but audiences of 200 are going to be all over the place. We're playing to micro audiences nowadays. And that's a really good thing. Look, it's no big secret that the audience is smaller today, but it's meant to be, and a common sense look at history tells us why. Classical music flourishes on the back of an emergent middle class. That's what happened where it all started in post-enlightenment Europe. Originally, it was the domain of the church and the kings and the princes. Now, all of a sudden, you have this merchant class, people who can read and can write and have money in their pockets, and what they want to do is emulate the aristocracy, so they want music like the kings and the princes had. Their drive was not a great love of classical music. Their drive was social aspiration. So you had a large audience that wasn't necessarily going to the concerts for the music. It was the same in late 19th century, early 20th century America. You had these institutions that started in Boston and New York. Once again, was it a great interest in classical music? I don't think so. It was that these cities needed a cultural component to be competitive with the cities of Europe. An interesting little barometer. At that time, a Queens-based piano manufacturer eclipsed all the European piano builders to become the largest in the world. Steinway. Today, the Pearl River Piano Company in China is the largest piano manufacturer in the world. And interest in classical music in China is surging on the back of an emergent middle class. Yes, we've had larger audiences before, but most of them weren't going actually to listen to the music. For the first time in our history, we've got people that are coming to the concerts to listen to the music, not to put on airs and graces, not for self-aggrandizement or social aspirations. It's fantastic. This is momentous. And you can choose to be part of the group that's bemoaning the demise of the status quo, or you can join those of us that are truly excited to be at the beginning of what is going to be recognized as a renaissance in classical music. Oh, this has got to be one of the most often asked questions. For hundreds of years, people have been asking this. The last thing I'm worried about is the aging of the audience. There are new old people every day. And it might be against conventional wisdom to say this, but truly I'm not so interested in reaching out to young people. I'm not interested in talking to you until you're in your mid thirties. To get the most out of classical music, you have to pay attention. You have to lean in and you have to actively listen. And most young people are not ready to do that. They've just got too much other stuff going on in their lives. I reckon about their mid thirties, they're ready to encounter something more substantial. And that's when I'm ready to meet them. Having said that, if you're 21 and you want to come to a concert, we'll welcome you with open arms. If you're not ready for it yet, it's okay. We'll be here waiting for you. We're not going anywhere. What is it? What does this question even mean? Am I meant to say, oh no, we aspire to mediocrity? How did classical music make elitist a bad term? The Marines didn't. The Ivy League didn't. They're proud to be elite. I want to be elite. I want to be the best. I want my group to be the best. Musicians devote their lives to the pursuit of perfection. This music, this art form is an exceptional product and only a minority of the population are ever going to engage with it. Yes, it's elite. It represents a pinnacle of human achievement. Here's the secret. Most people listening to classical music don't understand it. And unless you're some form of trained musician, it's unreasonable to expect you to. You don't need to understand it to experience it and enjoy it, but you do have to lean in and listen. And the more practice you get at doing that, the more you'll get from it. The tricky part though, is to find a group that's worth your time. That's easy in a big city, not so much elsewhere. So you gotta be careful. You asked about stuff I am boring before, and those are the last terms that can be applied to this music that is so vibrant and dynamic and exciting. Here's the truth. If you find it stuffy and boring, your ears are probably telling you the truth 
and you've run into a mediocre performance. My advice is find a group you can trust and go to everything they do. Don't pick and choose. If you invest in that way, there'll be a great reward. Your listening by the end of the season will have changed from the start of the season. And that'll happen year upon year. You don't need to understand classical music to begin to enjoy it. But as you listen more, the language will become more and more familiar and the rewards greater. It's an ongoing process. That's why this audience is so old. Once you start, you won't give it up. The harder you listen, the harder you look, the more you'll find. This music always is more to give than you can ask of it. When you become part of a musical community, you become part of a greater whole. The performances can be exhilarating, intriguing, or just plain fun. But there are those special moments when we're aware that we're part of something much, much bigger. This music is a living record of mankind's emotional history. And it's a record that cannot be rewritten by the victor. And we're part of it. At the moment of performance, this music is contemporaneous. It's a living experience. At that moment, the emotional reality, the emotional intent of the composer, documented as those little dots and strokes on a page, is brought to life by the experience and the emotional wherewithal of the performer. But it's only complete when the listener, through their own experience and reality, relates to it. At that moment, the music becomes a portal through which composer and performer and listener are united in a continuum unbounded by time or space. And it's that capacity, the fact that these moments occur regularly, make this music really very special. This music will never die. How musicians make a living from it will ebb and flow, but this music, is inextinguishable.